Tim. I get to serve as one of the pastors here. I uh, want to say welcome to all of you who are joining us, checking things out here in the room. I also want to say welcome uh, to those of you who join us online. Thanks for being with us as well. Let's give it up for those joining us on the other side of that camera right there. Glad that you're here with us. Hey, uh, last weekend was awesome. I don't know if you guys were here last weekend, but uh, it was amazing, amazing experience as we gathered together to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. 672 people joined us to celebrate Easter last weekend. It was awesome uh, to be a part of. Better than that, 43 people uh, checked out our church for the very first time and filled out a card, checked check that. Uh, it was awesome. Uh, we did a spiritual survey and uh, 52 people said that they are beginning a real relationship with Jesus. And uh, how, how cool is that? If that's not why we're here, then I don't know what I'm doing here. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, really cool, though, 138 of you uh, use your time, your talents to help roll out the red carpet for this community by volunteering. I just want to say thanks. Thanks for making an impact uh, right here in this city that we love. And uh, here's the cool thing about all those numbers. Numbers don't mean anything, but every one of those numbers has a name. Every one of those numbers has a story, and every one of those stories speaks of God's radical grace and his rescuing power, and I just want to say thanks. I'm so honored uh, to be a part of this church uh, where we get to help people find and follow Jesus. I'm so honored that I get to lock arms with people like you on a journey like this, and and if maybe you are one of those numbers, you said, hey, I was one of the the 52 people that made a decision to to make Jesus the leader and the forgiver of my life, then I just want to say thanks for showing up again. Uh, Thanks for being with us. Once you know we have your back, we are in your corner, and want to help you uh, along this this journey. Well, today we're kicking off a brand new series uh, on the Holy Spirit. We actually call the, Ho- the, Spirit, the, the series the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're just not that creative, you know. We're just going to call it like it is. This is a Holy Spirit series, all right. Uh, but before we get into that, uh, my goal for today is just give you an overview. We're going to do kind of a flyby. We're going to move fast, talk about the Holy Spirit. Next week we're going to talk more about how to uh, embrace the Holy Spirit, how to experience more of his activity in our daily lives. So I hope you'll come back for that. But uh, before we get started, I thought I'd share a story with you. One of my favorite questions to ask people is, what's one of the most embarrassing moments of your life? Um, I love that question for several reasons. One, it lets me know how self-aware they are. It lets me know how vulnerable they're willing to be with me. Uh, and it's always good for a few laughs. And so I thought I would, I would, once again, share with you one of my most embarrassing moments of my life, personally. So I started following Jesus when, uh, after I was 20 years old. And, uh, and light bulb just came on for me. Like, like, I knew some stuff about church. I knew some stuff about God. I knew some stuff about the Bible. And I would actually say that I, I believed in Jesus, that I believed that Jesus was the Son of God and that he, he died on the cross for my sins and, and rose again. I would say I cognitively believed that. Uh, but at the age of 20, I actually surrendered my life to him and said, my life is yours. And in that moment, when I stopped just having a cognitive understanding of who he was and I actually took action steps Uh, and begin to read the Bible and try to apply it to my life the best I knew how, it was like my whole world changed. I don't know if you've seen The the Matrix, uh, but it was like I took that pill, and like I saw this whole, I was like, my life has changed. And uh, I had to tell everybody about this, right? So I told all my friends, I I wanted to tell all my family members, because I I knew some some family members of mine uh, went to church, they went to church like longer than I'd been alive, but I wasn't sure that they had this encounter with God, and I wanted them to so desperately have that. And so they went to this little church outside of St. Louis, a little Baptist church. And, uh, and I thought, I got to go to this church and tell them what God has done in my life so they can have the same experience that I've had, right? The only problem was that uh, I wasn't a pastor. Uh, I was like a junkie just a few months ago. And so uh, how am I going to get a platform, right, to, to share this story? Well, my mom used to sing in church. My mom grew up singing in church. She's a great vocalist, still has a, a great gift in that area. Uh, And before she would sing a song, sometimes she would share a scripture or like a story that would tie into the song she's about to sing, right? And uh, and I thought, that's it. I'll tell the pastor I have a song that I need to sing. That God, the Holy Spirit has given me a song for your church. And I need to share it. And and so I have the audacity to call this pastor and like, hey, pastor, God's given me a song. I need to sing it for your church. And he lets me. So I show up at this church. I drive about three and a half hours to this church with this song, this song I'm going to sing. I can't clap on beat. If you hear somebody very confidently clapping off beat, it's probably me. Uh, I can't sing and clap at the same time. It's just I've never sang in public before, but I I wanted to share this message, right? So I show up. My grandma, uh, my great aunts, my my aunts and uncles, my cousins all show up. My, My grandma was a little spitfire leader, and she, like, rallied the whole community to come to hear her grandson, Right? 
And so, so I tee up the song for about 25 minutes. <laughs> I don't even know what I said. I was just talking. Uh, and then I thought, oh, man, it's time for me to put up or shut up. I told this pastor, I got a song to sing. Now I got to sing a song. I can't sing, right? But I'm a new, I'm a new follower of Jesus. I'm like, this is what you got to do. And so I, I, I give the nod to the guys in the back. And, and at this time, there's like uh, cassette tapes with accompaniment track, instrumental music that was supposed to play. And then I was going to sing, right? Well, I'm like, hey, play it, boys. Nothing. I'm like, no, really, like, play the music. It's time for me to sing. And then nothing, nothing happens. And I'm like, I don't know a whole lot, but I've, I've read enough of the Bible at this point to know, like, there's an enemy, and he's, he's out to steal, kill, and destroy, and there's God, and he's come to give me life, and life to the fullest. He wants to give these people life to the fullest. And so that must mean the enemy's, like, messing with my cassette tape. And so I'm not going to let the enemy get a win on my watch. And so I'm like, I'm about to sing this bad boy a cappella. I'm about to show the enemy who's boss, Right? It was probably the Holy Spirit saying, Tim, don't do it. Don't do it. Stop. Bail. And so I start singing a cappella. Never sang outside the shower in my life. And my aunts, my, my great aunts, sweetest ladies you'll ever meet, never speak anything negative, always encouraging. They're, they're like this. And then I start singing, and it's like, <laughs> like I'm doing something hideous in a public place, and I'm like, oh, this is bad, and it was one of those moments, like you're in the middle of the moment, right, and you just want to run, like in the middle of the song, I just wanted to bolt out of there and run for the coast and then just start swimming once I hit water, like I just wanted out of there as far away as I could, and, uh, and after, I, I finished the song, by the way, uh, muscled through, pushed through, probably shouldn't have, afterwards my aunts are like, Tim, you're a pretty good, s- uh, Tim, you are, um, hmm, they were pretty, ah. they're like, no, you know what, Tim, speaking, I think you should just talk to people. I think you should just stick with that. Like, stay in, stay in that lane, right? I tell you that to tell you this. Uh, sometimes in church space, sometimes people do stupid things and we blame the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we say, the, the Spirit of God told me to do this. Listen, the Spirit of God didn't tell me to sing. He wouldn't do that because he hasn't gifted me for that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but sometimes in church place space, uh, we do dumb things, and we blame the Holy Spirit for it. And listen, the Holy Spirit isn't weird. Uh, people are weird. <laughs> and therefore, people do dumb things, and we blame the Holy Spirit on it. So I just want to start with that as a foundation. Um, but in Acts 19, verses 1 through 2, uh, the Apostle Paul is writing this. And if you've never heard of the Apostle Paul, he's a guy who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament uh, and he was very, he's just a powerhouse uh, for the gospel. And, and Paul is writing in, in, in this book of Acts, he's not writing it, he's actually retelling the story. But he goes, let me just read it to you, I'll just tell you to you. It says, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. Ephesus was a city, it's modern day Turkey. Uh, the largest church in the New Testament was actually here in Ephesus. And there he found some disciples. And here's Paul's first question to them, and this would be Paul's first question to you. He asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, no, we have not ever heard of who the Holy Spirit is. And I think that would be true for most people who go to church uh, in America today. We just don't know who the Holy Spirit is. We don't know what he's about. We don't know really what he does. And and so over these next four weeks, uh, it's my hope that together we can learn who the Holy Spirit is, how he's active in our life, and how we can experience him to a greater degree. And so my role, my job today, is just to give you an overview who the Holy Spirit is, what he's about. And so I, I want to try to do that by answering two questions, two questions. The first question is this, who is he? Like, who is he? Who is the Holy Spirit? And then the second question I want to answer is, what will he do? But, but the first is, who is he? And so let's, let's dive in. We got uh, some fill in the blanks here. Uh, we, we didn't have these last week, so we're making up for lost time and gave you a bunch of them to fill in today, okay? So, so check these out. Um, they're in your program on your way in. First is this, that, that he is a him. He is a him. Now, I realize that is very grammatically incorrect. Uh, but, but it's the best way that I could think of to communicate this fact, because he is not some mystic cloud. He is not some force out there, but he is, is a him. And, and, and Jesus says these words in John 14, 17. Help me out with the words that are highlighted and uh, underlined here. It reads this. It says, the, the spirit of truth. He's talking about the Holy Spirit here. The world cannot accept 
because it neither sees nor knows, but you know, for lives in you, lives with you, and will be in you. I say that to say this. There's a whole lot that we could unpack in that text, uh, but I say that to say this. Jesus communicates, introduces the Holy Spirit as a him, not as an it, not as some some force out there. And, and here's my hope for you, and I start with this, because I think whenever we see the person of the Holy Spirit as a person, then we can get to know him personally. That's my hope, that you and I would know the Holy Spirit on a very personal level. Second point is this, second fill in the blank. Uh, he is not weird. He's not weird. I know you might have heard some weird things. I know you might have seen some weird things on TV. I, I know you might have even experienced some weird things. But, but I just want to, that really is the fill in the blank. He is not weird. He is not weird. Again, people are weird, and we blame the Holy Spirit for some weird things. Um, so my hope throughout this series, we set aside some preconceived ideas and just look at the scripture and say, okay, God, what does your word say about this Holy Spirit? Third is this. Uh, he is God. He is God. Uh, just an observation, just maybe my two cents. I, I think we're okay talking about Jesus. I think we're okay talking about God. But when we talk, start talking about the Holy Spirit, I think we're like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that, right? Uh, but, but Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Trinity, like uh, three in one, those are synonymous. So when we talk about God, we are talking about the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is God. Check this out in Acts 5, 3 through 4. It says this. Uh, then Peter said to Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? And then check this out. He says, you have not lied to men, but you have lied to God uh, because the Holy Spirit is God. And uh, so scripture highlights that, that the Holy Spirit is not separate from God. The Holy Spirit is God. Um, in Matthew 18, or 28, 19, and we read this. Help me out with the, the highlighted words. This highlights the three working together. It says, therefore, go. This is like our mission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of uh, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? So whenever we baptize people here, we baptize them in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three in one, the Trinity, working together because the Holy Spirit is God. Uh, by the way, if you have not been baptized since you've made Jesus the leader and the forgiver of your life, man, we would be honored to baptize you. Uh, if you're not familiar with baptism, what it even means, uh, you're fairly new to church, I would just say baptism is like this. Baptism is a lot like this wedding ring. Uh, this wedding ring doesn't make me a good husband. Uh, Tiffany can testify to that. Uh, doesn't make me say all the right things. Doesn't make me do all the right things. Uh, this ring is simply an indicator. It's an outward expression of an inward commitment I've made to my wife. Uh, and I wish it made me do all the right things, but this ring isn't, isn't that powerful. Uh, uh, baptism is like that, though. It's an outward expression of an inward commitment you've made to God. And, and the Bible talks about every believer, once they make a decision, once they make Jesus the leader and the forgiver of life, the best next step for you is to get baptized, to go public with your faith. We'd be honored to do that. Hey, I baptize you tomorrow. We can baptize you right now after this service if you want to. But we are planning for a baptism the week after Mother's Day. So you can invite your friends, family, mark that down. You can check that box on that uh, connection card. We'd be honored to baptize you. But I read that verse to say this. It, the Bible indicates that Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all working together, three in one, that's God. The Holy Spirit is God. Fourth, I would say this. He is my best friend. He's my best friend. So here's a confession. In the church, we have a sin problem. The problem isn't that we sin. Everybody's got that problem. Our problem is that we don't talk about it. Our, our problem is that we put up this barrier and we act like we don't have any problems. But let me just say this. You can never be fully loved unless you are to be, be fully known. But to be fully loved and yet fully known is the most healing gift one individual can give to another. And the Holy Spirit gives you that gift. The Holy Spirit knows everything you've ever done. The Holy Spirit knows everything about you, things that your spouse doesn't know about you, things that, that your best friend on earth doesn't, doesn't really know about you. He knows your thoughts before you thank them. He knows your, the intentions of your heart. He was there. He, he, he saw it all. He knows everything about you, and check this out. He still loves you. He still pursues you. When you were running from him, he was running after you. And in my book, because he knows everything about me, my deepest, darkest secrets, this thing I hope no one ever knows about, and yet he still wants this relationship with me. I am fully known by him, yet I am fully loved by him as well. And I believe that qualifies him to be my best friend. I hope he becomes your best friend as well because he knows everything about you. In 2 Corinthians 13, 14, we read this doxology, and that's a 
$5 word that basically just means a blessing at the end of a letter, a blessing at the end of a, a service. Sometimes we'll do a doxology at the end of our service, something like, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you and give you his peace. Blessings like that are, are known as doxologies. And in, in, in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, we read this doxology by, the, again, this guy named Paul. And he, he says these words. He says, may the amazing grace of the master, Jesus Christ. And it all starts there, right? It all starts with Jesus. Like we have this sin issue. Like we have to have a payment that must be made. And, and by embracing Jesus as a leader and forgiver of life, he pays our fine. He, he steps in. He pays our bill for us. That's called grace. It's receiving something that you didn't deserve. So the amazing grace of the master, Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God. Listen, God's love for you is extravagant. It's not just a little bit of love. Like he loves you extravagantly, above and beyond, overflowing, like next level kind of love. Like check this out. My name's Tim and I want to be your friend. But if me being your friend requires me to sacrifice one of my kids, I'm like, ha, it's nice knowing you, Right? But the extravagant love of God, he loved you so much that he was willing to give up his one and only son on behalf of you so that you and him can have a relationship together. Like, if that's not extravagant, I don't know what is. Like, like you, can, you know the value of something, not by the price tag on it, but by the price someone's willing to pay for it. Like, like we're trying to sell some stuff, right? And, and so we think we can get this for it. But the actual value is what someone's willing to pay, Right? And so, so how valuable are you to God? Listen, he was willing to go to the extravagant love of God, was willing to, to pay the ultimate price so that he can have a relationship with you. It's awesome. It's extravagant. The amazing grace of the master, Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God. And then, and then check this out. It says, help me out with this, this bold underlying word. It says, and the intimate friendship. That's good. The intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you. May the amazing grace of the master, Jesus Christ, may the extravagant love of God and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Listen, if you want to know God intimately, you want to know him personally, it's gonna be because you know the Holy Spirit. The intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit. So, so that's who he is. That's an overview, quick swipe. This is who he is. And now the second question, what will he do? Like what will... He do. And some of you are like, okay, this is where it gets weird, right? This is where the ushers pass out the tambourines. This is where we start handing out snakes, right? This is where things go off the rails, right? No, no, that's not happening. Uh, again, I already stated this is the Holy Spirit is not weird. If the Bible speaks for it, we're for it. If the Bible's silent, we're going to be silent. And so I just want to, throughout this series, we're just going to look, what, what does the Bible say about the Holy Spirit? How, how do we interact with him? How do we engage with the Holy Spirit and embrace who he is in our lives? So today I want to give you five things, five things that the Holy Spirit will do, five things. And we're going to look at John 14, 15, and 16. And let me set this up for you in this way. Uh, this is right before Jesus goes to the cross. Uh, in John uh, 13, uh, Jesus has the Last Supper with the disciples. He washes the disciples' feet. And then, then he goes to the cross, right? He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane where he's arrested. Then he eventually goes to the cross. But in John 14, 15, and 16, there's a conversation that takes place after the Last Supper, before the Garden of Gethsemane, before he's arrested, and Jesus talks to them about the Holy Spirit in great detail. And so if it's important enough for Jesus to have a conversation with his disciples right before he goes to the cross, I think it's pretty important to us. But not only that, after the cross, after his resurrection, after Jesus appears to hundreds of people, uh, he has another conversation, his very last words to his disciples about 150 people at the time, was regarding the Holy Spirit. And so I just say that to say this. This is vitally, let's just, maybe you're like, I'm not sure about the Holy Spirit stuff. Well, okay, let's just agree that to Jesus this was vitally important, and to the early church, to the disciples, the Holy Spirit was, was essential. And I believe it's essential for us here today. And here's why. Here's the first fill in the blank. Uh, it's essential to us because he will be with me. He will be with me. That's good news. I don't know about you, but that's good news. Because uh, my wife can't be with me all the time. And my buddies can't be with me all the time. But, but the Holy Spirit, he will be with me when no one else can. John 6, uh, 14, 16. Again, these are Jesus' words. This is Jesus' teaching on the Holy Spirit. We're going to look at five observations that Jesus makes. The first one is this, John 14, 16. Jesus says this. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another 
counselor, counselor. You might underline that word if you got your Bible with you, uh, to be with you forever. Uh, the New Testament was primarily written in, in Greek, uh, and it's translated from Greek into English, and I think most of the time that translation is, is really accurate. I think this was one word where we don't really have a word in our English language to adequately describe this word that that is translated counselor. Uh, it's a word for the Holy Spirit. It's, it's parakletos. It's, it can be translated as advocate, as helper, as counselor, as comforter. And parakletos in, in, the, in, in secular Greek was like a helper who's actually assigned. His primary role is to come alongside and to help. And so like if we're writing secular Greek literature and I wanted to move this sign, I would say, hey, Nathan, can you help me pick up this side? Then, then, then it would say, Tim summoned a parakletos to help him carry the sign. It's a helper. It's an advocate. The, the load's too heavy for me, so I need some help. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is that for you. He will be with you. Another counselor, someone to come alongside to help carry the load, an advocate to take up your cause, someone to mediate between you and, and other people, but also mediate between you and God. And so, so that's the Holy Spirit's role. He will be with me, and that's what he will, he will do. Second fill in the blank is this. Uh, he will reveal the Bible to me. He'll reveal the Bible to me. He'll, he'll reveal truth to us. John 14, 26, this is Jesus' words describing uh, this Holy Spirit right before he goes to the cross to let them know that, hey, your another best friend's coming. Here's who he is. He says the counselor. There's that word again. And now he attaches it, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said. One of the cool things, one of the cool realities of the Holy Spirit is that as you're reading scripture, as you're reading the Bible, like the, the Holy Spirit will illuminate truth to you. Like sometimes, I don't know, I, I've read the Bible a few times, but every time I read it, there's new things that come to life because the Holy Spirit's helping me understand it. And for me, this was huge whenever I started following Jesus. One of the best things, if you're a new believer, new follower of Jesus, you're just exploring the claims of Jesus. My, my hope for you is that you would get a Bible and you just begin reading it. And I would encourage you to get an NIV study Bible. My mom went and got me an NIV study Bible when I first started following Jesus because I didn't really understand a lot of it. But NIV study Bible has the scriptures up top and then an the explanation right below it. And so, so if that's helpful for you, if you read the Bible, you're like, I don't understand it. Well, get an NIV study Bible. It will help you understand it. And God will illuminate truth to you as you read it. And, and when you're talking to other people, it'll illuminate truth. It'll remind you of truth and say, hey, I think this is a word for you, John. I was reading this this week. Man, I just feel like this is for you. And it's, it's the Bible, right? So, so what do you do with that? Hey, I think you take it to the bank. I think it's, it's good. He'll remind us of truth. He'll lead us into truth. Um, third observation is this. He will help me share Jesus with others. He will help me share Jesus with others. And I would say, I would almost make this argument. I'd be so bold to say I think this is his primary role. I think his primary role is to help you have conversations with other people about Jesus and, and who he is. Is. I think this is his primary function. And here's, here's why this is so important. Because heaven and hell are real. People in my circle of influence are going to go one of two places. People in your circle of influence are going to land in one of two places. And, I, and it's God's hope that they, we populate heaven. That's kind of our mission. It's a big deal. The stakes are high. And so the Holy Spirit will help you share Jesus with others. John 15, 26 says this. This is Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit again. It says, when the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father will testify. He'll testify. He'll bear witness. He'll, he'll testify on your behalf about, about Jesus. Then we read this. These are Jesus' last words, his very last words. So, so before the cross, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. After the cross, he appears to hundreds of people. He has conversations. He actually has meals with people. He, he talks about a lot of things. But his last words, right before he ascends into heaven, is found here in Acts 1.8. And it says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Like that's it's kind of a big deal. Last words, before you do anything else, wait for the Holy Spirit. Receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And then check this out. And you will be my witnesses. This is the primary purpose of the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem. For us, that's, that's San Jose. That's Campbell, that's Morgan Hill, that's Gilroy, that's the Greater Bay area. It's a local uh, ge geography. Like whenever Jesus is saying this, he could literally see Jerusalem from the place where he was standing on the Mount of Olives. 
And so it's, it's our local context. We're going to be witnesses in San Jose, Campbell, Morgan Hill, Gilroy, Greater Bay Area. Uh, and then he expands the circle. He says, and then in Judea and Samaria, that's a region. So this could be California. This could be West Coast. This could be a, a greater region. That's our mission field. And then he says this, into the ends of the earth. And that's, that's our world. And so if Jesus was here, he would say, hey, Central Christian Church, here's what I want you to do. I want you to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes on, here's what you're going to do. You're going to be my witnesses in your local community, in your regional context, and even to the ends of the earth. And here's the deal. That's a big vision. That's a big calling that you have on your life. You're a missionary right here in San Jose. And God's spirit, it will power you to help you have some of those conversations, to, to help you have some of those difficult conversations with people at work, people at the grocery store, people on the baseball team, people on the soccer team, people in your circle of influence. That's his purpose. He will help you do that. And we need the Holy Spirit's help because it doesn't just stop here. It's regional. And then it's global. It's big. Big deal. Fourth is this. Uh, he will convict me of sin. He will convict me of sin. John 16, 8 says this. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. Now, conviction is not a, a word that we really like. Uh, but I would say this. I, I've come to see this function of the Holy Spirit as life-giving. I've come to see this as a, as a positive thing, not as a negative thing. Rather than the Holy Spirit's job is not to make you feel bad. Here's what the Holy Spirit does. He brings conviction into your life to point you in a better way. He wants to point you in the way of life, to point you in a better way. Because here's why. Sin looks very appetizing, doesn't it? It looks very appealing. To the natural eye, it's like, man, that looks really good. I think if I just did that, that would be a lot of fun. I think this looks really attractive. But the problem with it is the more that you engage in it, not, not only do you begin to erode on the outside, you, you just die a little bit more on the inside. And so the Holy Spirit brings conviction because the Holy Spirit wants you to come alive, not, not to be dead on the inside. Uh, maybe a way to illustrate it is like this. Uh, anybody got a car here? Anybody drive vehicles here in the room? All right, everyone with your hand up, you're the top five richest people in the world because you own a vehicle. That's true. That's true. You're rich. You got a car. Now, hey, if you have that car and you say, you know what, gas in San Jose is 425. <laughs> I'm from the Midwest, man. It's like two bucks right now. Um, 425. So you're like, hey, gas is super expensive. Gas actually stinks. Like it smells bad. It's hazardous to the environment. I spill on the ground. Like, like they bring out cones and they section it off. They spray stuff down. Like it's, it's a mess, right? So, so gas is expensive. Gas is, uh, stinks. Gas is hazardous to the environment. So here's what I want to do for my car. I got this hose at my house that's connected to my house. It's a garden hose. It has water. And water smells good, more readily accessible, and much cheaper than gasoline. So here's what I'm going to do. It looks a lot better. I'm going to put water in my gas tank, right? And we laugh because it's funny, right? Because we would say, who would do such a thing? But listen, we do it every day when we sin. Because the, the owner's manual says, you're not made to run on that. Listen, we put water in the gas tank and we can't figure out why we're stuck on the side of the road. Why is life not working out? Why do I feel so empty? Why do I feel so shallow? Why do I feel so dry? Why isn't the vehicle running? Well, because you pumped water into it, bro. Like, like listen, God's a gentleman. He, he's not going to stop you from living life the way you want to live it. But I'm just saying, don't be surprised when you're broken down on the side of the road. Because sin will leave you stranded. Sin will erode you from the inside. Here's why. Because you're not wired to run on water. You're wired to run on high octane. And so whenever I started applying the word of God to my life, I came alive and I was shocked because <laughs> I thought the Bible was a bunch of do's and don'ts. But what I realized was, no, it's an owner's manual for life. And I actually come alive whenever I do what the Bible says. I die on the inside when I am deceived by sin. So the Holy Spirit will convict me in regard of sin, righteousness, and judgment, not to make me feel bad, but to point me to a better way. And he'll do it for you. Isaiah 30, 21 reads this. It says, uh, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. He will guide you. And that leads me to my fifth and final point. He will guide me 
through life. He will guide me through life. Jesus said this in John 16, 13. It says, but when he, the Holy Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will only speak what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Check that out. Like the Bible actually says that the Holy Spirit can be working upstream from you in your life. Like before things come your way, like you can be aware of that. You can be activated by that. He can let you know like things that are not yet to come. Not in like a weird horoscope, hocus pocus type of way, uh, but he can lead you and guide you throughout life and let you know about things that are not yet to come. He will, he will guide you. I don't know if you guys ever listen to TED Talks, uh, but I listen to, a, I just like listening to communicators. I like learning how, how I can be better. And I got a lot of room for improvement, so thanks for being gracious with me. Uh, but I'll listen to this TED Talk by this guy named uh, Sir Ken Robinson. And the TED Talk was on education. I don't necessarily agree with all the TED Talk content, but this one on education was really good. Sir Ken Robinson on education. It's worth, worth checking out. I agree with some of the things he has to say. But, but he closed with this illustration of his talk, and I want to close with the same illustration that he used. And he, he lived outside of... Death Valley in Southern California, and Death Valley is this dry, arid place. You got this picture, check this out. Like, it, not a whole lot of life happening there, right? It's dry, it's desolate. It's, one of the, it's the driest place in the U.S. But in 2004, a, a weather pattern broke, and seven inches of rain fell in December of 2004 in Death Valley. And so by the spring, by Easter of 2005, what once was dry and desolate came to life. Check this out. And in a place where people thought, well, it's impossible for life to exist, began to flourish. What was impossible for life to happen came alive in Death Valley. New York Times newspaper article read, that, uh, that, that over 20 different species of wildflowers were in full bloom. I think we got a couple more pictures here to show you. Uh, one journalist and, and tourist, uh, they began to coin this phrase, super bloom, to describe what took place in Death Valley. I think we got this final one here. Check this out, it's beautiful. Death Valley, super bloom. Only God can do that. And I tell you that to tell you this. Some of you come into this place today and you feel like my heart is like Death Valley. On the inside, outside everything looks fine, but on the inside I feel dry. I feel tapped. I feel, I feel worn out. I feel empty. Maybe in your relationships, maybe in your marriage you think this is a desert area. Maybe in your finances, maybe in your career you think I don't know if there's any hope. I'm just saying, what once is dead can come alive. Death Valley had life waiting. It was just missing an essential ingredient, water. And once it had that essential ingredient, it began to flourish. I would just submit to you, what's dry, what's dead in your life can come alive again when the Holy Spirit saturates your life and brings his power into your present. You may say, well, Tim, how do I experience that? How, how do I experience that, that renewal? How do I experience that refreshing? Well, I, I'm glad you asked. Uh, I got this little helper back here. This is a cactus I keep on my desk to remind me to hug cactuses in my life. But, but it's kind of like this. For me, I would hear talks like this, and I would say, God, I want that. Pour out your spirit in the dry areas of my life. And I'd say, God, do it. And then when it wouldn't happen, I thought maybe God just didn't like me. And I understood that because I'd done some stupid things. But what I realized was I wasn't really surrendering my life to him. And here's what I want you to hear. If you hear nothing else, hear this. God cannot fill what God cannot have. Now, if you give him your life, he'll fill it. And the way you know you've given him your life is you begin to align your life the way the owner's manual says, we stop putting water in the gas tank. We begin to run on high octane. You want God to fill your relationships, you give him your relationships. Because here's what I believe. I believe God is always pouring out his spirit. We just are like, why isn't God pouring out his spirit on me? 
Well, because we're not positioned in such a way to receive from him. And here's what I believe. Just as Death Valley came alive, I believe you can come alive, but here's what you gotta do. You gotta say, God, here's my life. And I'm not just gonna acknowledge that cognitively, I'm gonna actually take action steps. God, whatever your word says, I'm gonna do it. God, I need you to help me come alive in my career because it feels very dry. And here's, here's how you know that you're taking those action steps. You're actually doing what God says to be a good employee, a good employer. I want you to help me come alive in my marriage. How do you know you're doing that? Well, because you begin to look at the Bible and say, God, what do you say about relationships? I, I want that. I want that. And here's what you'll experience. He'll pour out a spirit on you. Here's what you need to know. In your finances, you say, God, help me. I give you my finances. How do you know you're doing it? Well, you're going to apply biblical truth. And here's what's going to happen. God's going to saturate your life. And what once was dry, once what was once known as Death Valley, they're going to look at your life and say, that's a super bloom. It's awesome. God has that ability, desires to do it. The question is, will you position yourself where he's working or will you just continue the way you've been living? The choice is yours. He's a gentleman. He won't force you. The opportunity is yours. In a moment, the band's gonna lead us in one final song. And my hope for you, the response is just for you. Whatever you have, whatever is dry, whatever feels weary, you just give to him in these next few moments and say, God, it's yours. I need your Holy Spirit's help. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're not a respecter of persons, that God, we can all experience your activity in our lives when we surrender to you. So God, I pray that you'd help me, you'd help all my friends here to experience your activity to a greater degree as we surrender those dry areas of our life. May you fill us afresh with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.